absolutely delighted to have this opportunity to talk to you. Particularly delighted because last year, around the same time, we had a meeting, uh, our sort of first organizational meeting for this summer school, and I felt very ill and I had to be sort of virtually evacuated without speaking, which really upset me because I really wanted to have said my piece and then fallen ill. But um, anyway, without further ado, what um, I hope to do today, and I mean it quite seriously, this is just a brief preview of coming attractions. Joe Primack and Anthony Aguirre are going to be giving a set of lectures that will elaborate on many um, of the points that I will very, very briefly cover here. So what I will be doing, though, is giving you a snapshot of our current understanding in cosmology of theoretical understanding, which is bolstered very, very strongly with observational data in many, many different wavelengths. So I'll try to show you a little bit of uh, how successful a theory, remarkably successful a theory we currently have, and the role of sort of the interesting role that simulations and observations in tandem have played in ratifying, validating many of the assumptions and the predictions of this theory. And then I will move on towards the end to phrase what I see, it's a personal perspective, on what I see are some very interesting philosophical issues that are raised by the current status of this theory. And in particular, I want to focus, so this sort of my, the pet things that I'm interested in, um, is the role of simulations and how similar or dissimilar are computer simulations, which are sort of the standard now in cosmology, how similar or dissimilar they are to actual experiments. And this is an important question because it really ties into what I think are some of the key philosophical issues that are hard to circumvent in cosmology. The fact that we have only one universe, and the fact that we can make measurements only in this one so model system. We don't actually have an ensemble of universes in which we can go and make an independent measurements and figure out uh, a statistical uh, description of universes. The reason for that is that there are a set, particular set of numbers, a limited number of constants, that define the particular theoretical model that I'll be talking about. And they have precise values, and most of them can be measured. And the question is, why do they have the values that they do? And, and an argument has been made quite eloquently in many popular books, including one that um, Nancy and Joe have written, and one, one that my former advisor, Martin Brees, has written, called Just Six Numbers, in which they, they argue and they show that that our universe does have a particular draw of these six numbers, and there are different ways in which you can reconcile why those numbers have the values that they do. And so I think where I want to end is, I um, want to give you a little bit of a glimpse, and I think probably Anthony will be talking much more about it, he's more of an expert than I am, on the very, very early universe, on sort of the pre-Big Bang universe, and current theoretical models um, or that describe that epoch. And I think I would hope to tie it back very nicely to Tim's presentation just now, uh, where I'm going to make the case that the problem with pre-Big Bang physics and our knowledge of physics and our mathematical descriptions of that epoch, to which we will never have empirical access, is that new kinds of explanation and a new kind of explanatory power will have to be invoked. And the reason I say it's new is because a probabilistic distribution, uh, a probabilistic uh, explanation will not suffice. An empirical, uh, um, an empirical explanation is not allowed, is not possible. So the question is, how do you figure out the criteria? How do you rank order the criteria? that tell you what is a valid explanation. And the reason you want to do that is you want to discriminate between theories and theoretical descriptions of that epoch. And the, 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 and the reason this is problematic is that any theory that explains pre-Big Bang physics 
has to, by construction, patch on at very later times to all the observations that we see. So that's the only empirical lever that you have, and all theories have to satisfy those observations. And, and because we don't have empirical access, at least at the moment from my current understanding of these string theory models, multiverse models, there aren't any direct empirical predictions that can be made for the very late universe that can distinguish those models. Okay, so that's sort of where I want to end. So let me quickly move on and, and show you what our current understanding looks like. And our current understanding, much as I say that it's, we have a remarkably well-structured theory, I mean, it's, it has a few <coughs> major embarrassments that we hide. And the major embarrassments are that our universe, we live in a cosmos whose composition the majority of the constituents of this composition, we actually do not know their precise nature. We can measure the constituents, we can measure the, the contribution to the energy budget of the universe from these two constituents, dark matter and dark energy, but beyond that, we, we know a lot more about dark matter, but we don't know what particle it is. Okay, what particle constitutes dark matter has remained elusive. There are some interesting experiments, and you know, there may be something uh, um, interesting coming out experimentally, but at the moment, we don't. So this is just to show you, this is just to give you to tease a little bit and show that this is the latest composition, which has changed minorly, doesn't, for the purposes of our, our discussion, it really doesn't matter, the pie chart has changed very, very slightly. This is after the latest results from the Planck satellite. Um, a microwave background experiment, and these results just came out a few months ago, so in April, and you know, I thought I have to show you that this is, but this is how well we understand the theory. And I'll show you the difference in terms of resolution of Planck compared to an equivalent earlier experiment called WMAP, and you'll see that, look, this is pretty robust, right? I mean, in terms of the contribution to dark energy has gone from about 73% to 68.3, and most importantly, this sliver, which is ordinary atoms and baryons, has gone from about 4 to 4.9%. So for, for cosmologists, there's you know, obviously a lot of interesting stuff to understand in this chain. But for the purposes of our argument, right, this is a fairly robust theory that has predicted, the, uh, given the observational data that we have, the best fit model makes a prediction which is very, very consistent. And the one other interesting thing about this theory, this is the lambda core dark matter theory, that actually Joel and Nancy have a very nice name for it. It's called double dark theory. Um, and I actually like that name. So this theory suggests that dark matter, which composes the majority of the matter content of our universe, is actually made of particles that we know for sure are not ordinary atoms. Okay? that we need some non-baryonic dark matter. Okay? So we understand the composition quite well. So this inventory is very well understood. And the state of the art experiments are only tweaking that slightly. Okay? And this is just, these are just graphs that you might have seen that uh, have given us the evidence for dark energy. Dark energy is this mysterious force that is countervailing gravity at late times in the universe. Um, we don't actually have an ab initio model that explains what dark energy is. What we have at the moment is we model dark energy as some kind of fluid with an equation of state, a simple equation of state like the ones you've all seen before, which is pressure is proportional to the density. It just so happens that the constant of proportionality here, W, is minus one. That appears to be the best fit. So this is sort of a negative pressure fluid, which is a little counterintuitive, but that seems to be the best description of dark energy. This is not what dark energy is. It's a good description of whatever dark energy may be. Okay? And the other thing that we do know is that its effect kicks in in the late universe. And the late, by the late universe, I mean sort of a redshift of about two or so and Below is when you start, it starts dominating the energy budget, giving you this inventory. 
At earlier times, the inventory was different. Yep. Is dark energy associated? Are we talking about the cosmological constant? It, it, it looks indistinguishable uh, observationally from the effect of a cosmological constant. That's correct. Yeah. But you know, the cosmological constant is another unsolved problem. So, you know, <clears throat> so I think that you know one thing that has to be pointed out. So the fundamental assumption that Einstein made, like his insight, that the contents, the fate, and the geometry of the universe are intricately linked, that seems to be extremely robust. So at this point, there's no data that suggests that uh, that description needs to be called into question. And, um, and I think that, so obviously knowing two gives you the other and so on, so that's sort of been the empirical way to access. So what else do we really know very well about this theory? So one other thing that we do know very, very well, aside from the overall inventory, is how structure forms in the universe. Structure like present day galaxies, we actually know the entire storyline. We have gaps in the storyline, but we actually have empirical data that anchor, and now with the biggest telescopes and on Earth as well, the collecting power, large collecting power telescope, as well as telescopes in space, we now have, um, we look far back into the universe where our access in terms of look back time has expanded hugely. So we actually have data at various epochs of the universe, various stages, when astrophysical processes are fundamentally transforming the contents of the universe. So we, we have a theory, or rather a class of theories, I don't like to call it a single theory, a class of theories of inflation that actually predict what kinds of fluctuations, the density fluctuations there ought to be to initiate the formation of structure, and we can then propagate that down, those fluctuations grow, they get amplified by gravity, and we can predict that the cosmic microwave background radiation, the relic of the Big Bang, how it would scatter through the screen of structure and arrive at us today, and it's cooled down, it's now in the microwave, that's the data, that's the Planck data, that's the data that gave us that inventory. So we have this full sequence, we have a pretty good idea of Roughly when the first stars form, we of course don't have all the details cornered, like what are the masses of the first stars, we don't know that for sure. We have a bunch of ranges in which we think the first stars form, we kind of know where they can form, what are the conditions that are needed to form them and so on, and we know how the present day galaxies, by and large, I mean there are of course many unsolved problems, and galaxy formation is a very, very active field at the moment. But I think what is key here is just that we have an initial hot, dense, and fairly smooth, very small fluctuations that get amplified by gravity to what we see today, which is a cool, rarefied, and very comfy universe. So one of the reasons I'm sort of spending time with this is to try and show you the various predictions, the various constraints that a cosmological theory that we currently have satisfied. The satisfies. So we actually have data from everywhere since the, the surface of last scattering of the cosmic microwave background down to redshift zero, which is today. So the only time we don't have access, we don't have data, direct data, is prior to the last scattering surface. There's no direct radiation that is received from that effect. So this defines what I'm going to show you in a minute as the extent of our visible universe. <clears throat> Do you have a question? I was just, do the, uh, in the previous slide, yeah. the smooth and then late, clumpy sort of states of the cosmos, do those comport respectively to low and high entropy states when gravity is in play on, the, on this like standard understanding? Sure, although you know, I am not really going to talk about entropy at all. Uh, I was just curious. Yeah, I'm not going to be talking about entropy, and I'm not going to talk about the arrow of time. So you don't like entropy? No, I like it. But <laughs> I'm not sure I understand it well enough. Okay, so this is another sort of pictorial uh, depiction, and I, I like this one because it gives you a sense of the expansion history of the universe, right? So right very early on, you had these quantum fluctuations, and you had a sort of exponential expansion for a very brief. Moment, moment in time, the inflationary epoch, 
after which the expansion actually slows down compared to the uh, exponential expansion. And then you have what this shows you very nicely is that there is a phase after the surface of last scattering when the universe is very opaque to all radiation. Those are called referred to as the dark ages. And then the first structures start to form. And so at this point, we are sort of dark matter dominated and then dark energy dominated. We start picking up the dark energy domination starts roughly late in the universe. OK, so what are all the so some of, some of the some of what were thought of as intractable problems with the early models in cosmology. Yeah. I, I just wanted to compliment what you said about the, we only have empirical access to light back to the source of last scattering, uh, and we definitely don't have pretty big bang empirical access, but we do have some empirical access between big bang and the source of last scattering light from nucleosynthesis and formation of the elements, relics of the early universe that still survive today. And there's no direct radiation. No direct radiation, but we, have, was, yeah. we still have some empirical access. Oh, absolutely. But we have, we have some access in terms of the after the first, all the elements that we see uh, was synthesized after the first three minutes, in the first three minutes, and uh, that's up to lithium, was synthesized in the first, <coughs> excuse me, in the first three minutes, and everything heavier than lithium is basically synthesized in stars. So nothing heavier than lithium actually formed before the first stars formed, and deuterium, or you know, anything else that the elements that were formed early on, uh, we do have measurements. There are slightly complicated measurements because, you know, for example, if you go and measure lithium, lithium can be created and destroyed. So you don't actually see the pristine amount of lithium. So, but yeah, but it's not um, direct, no radiation. Yeah. So when, when, when people say certain, at certain epochs, dark matter dominated and then dark or dark energy, so what is the measure by which that statement is made? So I think the, the uh, contents of the universe determine the expansion history of the universe. So what, what is determined, so it's the omega, which is the contribution of that particular, so when you look at dark matter, it's in the total of one, omega total appears to be one, so you have dark matter, dark energy, a little bit of radiation constituting a teeny weeny bit, and the sum of that has to be one, and at various epochs, the, uh, the relative ratio of dark matter to dark energy is different, and the way that's manifested is in how fast the universe expands. And the way you would see that is you would see that in Hubble diagrams. So if you were an observer at a time when the university, universe is not dark, matter, dark energy dominated like it is today, you would see a slightly different Hubble diagram. And, this is, and it's manifested in a Hubble diagram, which basically tells you the cosmic flows. And it shows you a deviation from sort of a linear law the further you go out. And in that departure from the linear law, you have information on the expansion history, and that's sort of how it's inferred. And that was the picture you that had? That was the first picture, picture that I had over... In the top left? Here. Yeah, okay, all right. So it's now measurable. Okay, so what we're seeing originally as problems, uh, I just want to point out, you know, there's a reason why I like to talk of inflation as a set of theories and not as one theory, uh, because of it's a generic nature, and I want to explain why, uh, why I have this stance. So inflation is generic because it was invoked to cleverly solve a couple of problems that arose in observation cosmology. One of them, the key, the key uh, observation that drove um, the formulation of inflation, well, required infl inf uh, inflation, of some version of inflation, and I say this because many versions of inflation are then compatible, it turns out. Um, and that is the homogeneity, the, the very small difference in temperature that's measured in the microwave background, in the microwave sky, in regions that could not have been causally connected. So they have the same temperature to within the 50 decimal place. And that poses a real problem because any two locations that <coughs> because that is true for any two locations on the sky. And this would not be the case if these any two locations, random locations, would not have been in causal contact. And the way this can be fixed is by having the universe be very compact at early times and go through an exponential expansion phase. So they were in causal contact at that time before expansion actually appears to have pushed them out of causal contact. And so that was something 
that observations and measurements of the cosmic microwave background temperature uh, require. So roughly the COBE satellite was the first satellite that actually made these measurements. And the reason the COBE satellite um, was stunning is that the theoretical prediction was that the spectrum was a black body spectrum. And it was shown to be the data showed that that was a fantastic match to the observational data. So, and predicated on the derivation of that spectrum was the whole theory of structure formation. Because what you needed to predict was these photons from the last scattering surface, their journey through all the structure that has formed in the universe, right? And therefore, a match, an exquisite match to the prediction of a black body spectrum today suggests was in turn a test of our structure formation model. So we have the general picture of structure formation, right? Basically, dark matter is in the driver's seat, and these fluctuations are in dark matter. Galaxies form in collapsed dark matter halos. And we have that picture. It's hierarchically assembled. We have that picture largely right. Because if we didn't have it right, we would not have been able to make the prediction and match the observations of a perfect black body spectrum for the cosmic microwave background radiation. So, um, as I said, what it does is the match with uh, the cosmic microwave background data then tells us that we have a pretty good understanding of the nearby universe as well. So basically the nearby universe uh, looks much more clumpy than the early universe because these, um, um, these fluctuations got amplified by gravity over, uh, over time. So I, want to, I wanted to draw attention to sort of this, um, this visualization. So all the empirical access that we have, right, the direct empirical access that we have is really out to the surface of glass cavern. Okay. And yes, indeed, we have seen you know, some, some idea of nucleosynthesis that you know, ratifies our understanding of the hot Big Bang model of an initial state. Oops. Is it on your computer? Yeah, it's on my computer. All right, so what happened is, it went to sleep because I yeah, Eric. Uh, we have to remember to always turn it off during the breaks because it's got a three-hour timer and uh, it just turns off automatically after three hours. Oh, so it'll hit. So it'll hit. It'll hit. Okay. Eric re is restarting it and then it'll take a minute and you'll get it back. Sorry. So the the reason I keep stressing the last scattering surface and this point of empirical uh, access is the kind of direct observation of probes that we uh, that enable us to get data within this Hubble quantum. Okay. And this will be int uh, this will be important and significant when I uh, discuss what I see are some of the challenges later on. It's not happening. Should I? No, it, it just give it a moment. Oh, it's just warming up. Yeah, it's warming up. Yeah, it's still flashing. Actually, maybe uh, it's worth mentioning. Last scattering surface means when the cosmic background radiation was emitted. Before yeah. that, it's like looking into the sun. It's a plasma, and plasmas are opaque. Yeah. So no real information other than the fact that it's a plasma. And because we now have a theory that is anchored at the surface of last scattering surface, we can actually extrapolate it and figure out what the temperature of the universe was at early time, earlier times. Thing that we know we could get from mm -hmm. before the surface of glass scattering is gravity waves. That's right. Uh, that, yeah, that's right. We could get gravity waves. We could get that signal. We don't have it yet. <coughs> but we don't have uh, gravity waves yet. Or perhaps a neutrino background of some sort. Right. If, if, yes, if we can measure it. It should exist, but quite challenging to measure. Well, we might need a, a solar system size detector of some sort. Sure. Yeah. Well, the age is dead. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Not with the present house. I don't think so. Well, yeah, or not even with the optimistic. Uh, so anyway, this is just to show you through the level of advance in terms of the uh, observational precision. That so this is a region of the cosmic microwave background sky. It's seen by W map, and that's the plan. Notice that you know all the information about structure formation and all the structure that's encountered along the line of sight to us is encoded in these temperature fluctuations. 
and notice the, the scale, the physical scale, it's the same size patch. Notice the detail that we can now access. So you can see immediately that the structure formation theories can be tested at an extremely high level. Okay? And this theory that you know, the lambda CDM model, which is uh, the cold dark matter dominated model, um, seems to survive. You know, we've gone from the COBE, which was much coarser, to something like this, to this, and this theory has survived. And so just, you know, to give you a face, so this model is really quite well tested. And uh, this is just to show you sort of one new sort of quantity that uh, the Planck satellite has measured. Again, it's a measure of structure formation. To give you an idea, well, the prediction is the black curve, and the boxes are the data with errors uh, that are proportional to the height of the box. OK. <clears throat> so where are we? So in this theory, the, basically it was the first instrument, the first results showed you that you had a very homogeneous early universe and uh, that recombination, hydrogen occurs in the universe is about 500,000 years old, give or take a little bit. And the overdense regions contain hotter gas, photons are gravitationally redshifted, and the density was uniform to one part in 10 to the 5 at that effort, right? So what this tells you is that from that early state, we have a successful theory that can explain what we see. So once again, I just want to come back to this point that I made earlier about causal contact. So observer point A, point B, you wouldn't expect them to have been in causal contact and have coordinated their temperatures to the fifth decimal place as they appear to have. But a general theory of inflation, sort of the generic idea of inflation is what is needed in order to explain that. And it fixes several other problems. It also provides you a way um, sort of a justification sort of, of an initial fluctuation generator. Okay? So, so let's now come to the nearby universe. So the nearby universe is extremely inhomogeneous. Linear versions of structure formation theories are insufficient to understand how they form. Yeah? Um, sorry, I have yeah, a question. Sorry. Yeah, no, no. To the next point. I mean, I, the, the cosmos isn't sort of like perfectly homogeneous, obviously. I mean, that's the point. Results are highlighting that. Do you believe that inflation sort of accounts for the inhomogeneities? Just as well as it accounts for the homogeneities? Or does that make sense? Well, I don't understand your question. Okay, sorry. So, um, inflation. Inflation predicts the fluctuation spectrum, gives you predictions for an initial fluctuation spectrum. And different models of inflation can give you features in that, you know, can be discriminated on the basis of those fluctuations because it's a different ratio of tensor to vector, um, scalar to tensor modes, et cetera, et cetera. So there, you know, there are some sort of gradations or variations in the theory that can explain how the initial fluctuations are generated. But they are gener generically all inflationary models. So you start from there and then you amplify those nearly homogeneous, very small fluctuations. You amplify them to fluctuations where the density contrast between the mean and a region where a galaxy forms can be 10 to the 10 to the 5, 1,000 to um, 100,000 at late times. So from understanding you, it sounds mm -hmm. like you're saying, look, we're going to account for the inhomogeneities in the data we've got uh, or in, in the cosmos by the fluctuations in particular sort. And these fluctuations fall out of the inflation area. Uh, they are pre they're initiated. It's sort of the fluctuation right. generator. You can think of it as a machine that right. generates the fluctuation. Right. Right. But then it's gravity that does all the amplifying. Right, okay. So, uh, so it looks like the answer to my question is, yeah, inflation is going to be able to account for the homogeneities by virtue of the fact that it has room in it, in the theory. Right, but not but inflation by itself. Inflation with the structure formation theory tacked onto it. Sure. Right, and which is why I keep saying inflationary models are sort of generic right. because you know, any, infla any flavor of inflationary model that you want to have, as long as you tap on the structure formation theory, which we know works very well, and that, you know, in, in, sorry, in conjunction, it can explain what we see today, even in the nearby Let me just clarify, because yeah. I think maybe people aren't completely get it. So one of the things that we learned from, for example, Tom and earlier, WMAP, the earlier coding, uh, what we learned is 
the composition of the universe. We learn how much dark matter there is, how much other stuff there is, how much ordinary matter there is. And it's because, given the sort of generic inflationary prediction, plus the way that Planck, the statistics of, of what Planck found. Yeah, the reason why I ask is because there are some people who are arguing that actually the Planck results are somewhat inconsistent with um, inflation and technology. Right, and no, and I think that, the, uh, oh, I see. We're so going to discuss this in great detail. detail. Well, yeah, I was going to say good. that, yeah, I, I'm not going to, I want to go into, yes, okay. that Planck results torque the model a little bit. Okay. Inflation yeah. models. They ruled out some interest, some models that were deemed to be interesting earlier. Um, but the structure formation piece is by and large, Joe, would you agree? The structure formation piece by and large looks robust. Yes. By that's, what the yeah, that's what the plant people claim. And, and I'm convinced. Um, but so the nearby universe is very homogeneous. And, the, and you know, we have now mapped the large scale structure of the nearby universe extremely well as well. And I, and I like to show this because we've come a very long way. So this is one of the first maps published by Valerie de la Peron and Geller and Papra in 1986. Right? And this is a slice that had about a thousand gases revolution. Right? So they find the structure, the sort of this man, uh, the stick man in the center. And this was sort of the first time that, you know, at each dot here is a galaxy. Um, but where were we? In 2002, every blue dot, you can no longer see a single dot. This is the 2DF redshift survey. The same idea, you go out and you measure, you count galaxies, but you also know where they are in 3D space. You know their redshift. So this is sort of a pie diagram. And you can see the structure is highly inhomogeneous, right? So it's very clumpy. This is the nearby universe that we are here at this vantage point and we're looking out. And we can now calculate in exquisite detail the statistics of these distributions that you see. Right, the two-point function, three-point correlation function, oh, galaxies again, see, galaxies one dot. And, and the model makes those predictions, okay, and we can verify them. So they're very, very well verified. And this is particularly interesting because one of the interesting things about the model, as I said, dark matter is in the driver's seat, and the prediction is all about the statistics of dark matter. And we just say that galaxies form in halos of dark matter, but this precise recipe of how you assign a galaxy to a halo is the current frontier in research, galaxy formation, okay? We don't understand that fully. We have a reasonable understanding, but we don't understand every astrophysical process that's important, yet we can test this theory, okay? And this theory holds up. So details like, you know, getting the shapes of galaxies, getting the proportion of galaxies of different morphological types at different epochs in the universe, that's not sorted out. But statistics, the statistics that does measure, that is predicted for dark matter halos, that we can test with some models and by assigning mass to light, we have some pretty good models that are not fully tight at the moment. We actually, this theory stands up. Okay, so the theory is extremely robust. So how? Is there a simple, a reasonably simple closed form probability distribution for the um, distribution of Fluctuations? Yeah. Glossy I mean, not just, fluctuations. not just data like correlation, but a nice close form probability like a Gibbs distribution. For what? For the distribution of galaxies? For all the statistics, yes. Yes, absolutely. The, the cold dark matter theory is because the initial fluctuations are from a Gaussian random field, you can actually calculate everything. Uh -huh. And Jim Peebles at Princeton did sort of the first calculations of sort of the detailed endpoint statistics of these density fields out to late times. But the interesting thing is that those analytic closed form uh, solutions don't capture non-linearities, as one can imagine, right? And non-linearities are very important at late times. And non-linearities are critically important if we want to try and understand at a deeper level the relationship between light and mass, which is basically how galaxies form and what is the relationship of the baryons which don't appear to interact with cold dark matter, except that they feel the gravity of cold dark matter. We don't actually think that they couple electromagnetically or in any other sense, okay? At the moment, there's no real evidence. 
Although we all play around with models where dark matter is somewhat weakly self-interacting uh, and so on, at the moment I think it would be fair to say that there is no compelling um, um, data that requires that. So however, um, leading on to Shelley's question, the point is in order to make these tests um, at late times where we now have sort of copious data, what we really needed to understand is the progression of nonlinearity. Sort of a linear description, a linear theory is not going to capture and allow you to calculate higher order moments of distribution, statistical properties. So you needed uh, a sophisticated calculation that um, enables you to do that, and computer simulations of structure formation offer you precisely that. And the reason why this problem even is tractable is, luckily for us, dark matter and gravity are the key players. And gravity is quite simple, simple, um, to actually implement algorithmically. So what I'm going to outline briefly is sort of, you know, and I'm sure Joel's going to be talking much more, and I don't want to see, I won't be showing the latest, greatest pictures because they are basically from Joel's group, the greatest, latest simulations called the Bolshoi. Um, what I'm going to show you is sort of the schematic of what all of these simulations actually comprise of. Like what's the idea? What do they actually do? So what you start with, essentially you start with the initial fluctuation spectrum and you propagate it forward um, uh, in time and with gravity. And so you look at the amplification and you just basically need to compute as time goes on uh, just what gravity does to amplify the homogeneities in, in an expanding universe. So you need to be actually do it consistently in a universe that is expanding. Um, you need to calculate the aggregation. So I, mean, I have a couple of dense slides that I'll quickly go through because I'll tell you what the idea is, what I was trying to do here, and you can look at it when you give my slides up. So basically what, I, what, what you need to do and understand is that you have Fluctuation. So this is just you know the story, the life and times of four perturbations, four density perturbations in the dark matter at early times. So they have different amplitudes. This has the highest amplitude, so largest fluctuations, and they are smoother fluctuations. And um, what what you need to follow in a computer simulation is basically there are uh, fluctuations on every scale. Okay, so I've just shown you four here. And I just want to give you a feel for what it is the, the uh, actual um, simulation does. And you know, and these are sort of these are qualitative things that we can sort of understand by just following, say, theoretically, four fluctuations, four perturbations, right? And you see, basically, you, you very quickly generate over dense regions and under dense regions, and you can quickly calculate and see that you have greater deceleration of expansion in the over dense regions. So these over-dense regions behave like little closed universes. The under-dense regions behave like open, little open universes, and so on. And so you form voids, you form structures. And basically, you have, from general relativity, you have solutions for the evolution of density perturbations, which you can calculate. Uh, but the rough, as I said, the reason you need a simulation is there are fluctuations really on all scales. There's no preferred scale in the universe. There's no preferred fluctuation scale. And the evolution of um, evolution therefore has to be tracked using numerical simulation. And so in these cold dark matter dominated models, so a, a model in which the initial composition is do dominated by cold dark matter, non-interacting cold dark matter, the buildup of structure is hierarchical or bottom up. So small ob objects form highly and then they merge. And so clusters of galaxies, which are the most massive assembled structures in the universe, form relatively late. So this is just to give you a quick visual so you can read the words later. So you have some initial density fluctuation and that gets amplified and then you know, fluctuations about a certain threshold. So the matter in this density peak here will coalesce and form a dark matter halo which will eventually see the galaxy. Okay? And this threshold obviously varies with time in the universe and it depends on when in the universe. So the expansion history of general that threshold will clearly depend. You have to be over dense above the mean. And to give you a sense of structures, so I was trying to figure out what would be a nice figurative way to, to kind of motivate the notion of a power spectrum. Most of you already probably know what a power spectrum is. So the power spectrum describes the typical amplitude of a density perturbation as a function 
of the scale length of that perturbation. So it's like looking at some tiling pattern and looking at the evolution of that tiling pattern over time. Okay? And so that's what the simulation actually does. So just to give you a sense of power spectrum and scale and fluctuations and what fluctuations look like as a function of their scale. Okay, so these are all things that are done inside the simulation. Okay. And, um, and so having power, so uh, an initial power spectrum, so the game is to basically start with an initial power spectrum, evolve it in the simulation over time, and look at the final power spectrum. And then compare with measurements, because we can calculate the statistics of the distribution of galaxies, is, tells you what the power spectrum today is, and you compare that with the power spectrum that's predicted from the simulation. Okay? And you know, you can, so basically you can start with these little simple forms and propagate them. And the interesting thing is that you have to match the observations that are, that are um, at every epoch. So your model has to. So let me quickly sort of point here to essentially how we are testing this theory. And I'm spending time on this because I think this is, it's problematic in some ways. And it's, problem, it's problematic for philosophers. It's not problematic for cosmologists. So like, okay, we kind of found the genetic theory that works rather well. Let's focus in on the details that we don't understand. But um, what are we really doing? So we are simulating a, si a slice of the universe, a small portion of the universe that we deem to be representative because we have a full theory. And so we're simulating a portion of the universe. And then we say we want to match the statistics of structure that forms in that single patch of one universe in which single random patch, and we compare that with observational data that we. Um, and of course, you may ask, okay, the simulation has to be big enough that you have enough representative further small patches in it, so that you know you you're not you're not making the claim that every single galaxy that you see or little cluster or group that you see here, you need to reproduce in the box. What you're really trying to do, of course, now we have large enough simulations and there is enough um, probing enough of a spatial um, sized region of the universe that you can actually make those correspondence better. correspondence is better. So you make enough massive halos, you make the right proportion of massive halos, less massive halos, so you match something that's called a mass function, which is a function of the number of halos of a given mass. So there's a whole range uh, in the universe and that, ever, that function evolves in time because it's hierarchical buildup of structures. You have a lot of small scale stuff all the time, but the most massive things start to appear later on in the box. So if we have massive clusters that we want to compare with simulations, then our box has to be large enough that a large enough cluster does work, right? So, that, so you know, obviously the kinds of, uh, uh, kinds of, um, Simulation of state of the art are several billion particles, basically. I think Joel will be showing you some fantastic movies of the latest of the state of the art. So essentially, what is this cosmological simulation? The ingredients are initial fluctuation spectrums. So you have the equations that describe the spatial temporal evolution, evolution under gravity, and then you basically have statistics of the underlying distribution of the dark matter that you can uh, check. And then you have some ansatz to relate dark matter to galaxies. So that in your box, every time you have a dark matter halo, you assign <laughs> galaxies to it, and then you compare it with the observed galaxy distribution. Okay, uh, so let me give you a sort of a rough visual sense of this. This is sort of an old, uh, of an old paper that basically shows you how these fluctuations, visually, how these fluctuations <coughs> increase in time, how they evolve in time. So that's from the initial conditions, basically, you set it up. And you can see some fluctuations. You can see some over-dense regions and under-dense regions already. Notice how those dense clouds form. They get amplified and end up with structure that you see. So you know, this is, the simulations have become very sophisticated. And what, what you're seeing here is basically the dark matter that's mocked up to look like light. So the yellow is not light here. So it's here that if you, it's a zoom in of this region. And what you see here as specs, and what you see there as red and blue, are basically galaxies that are assigned to halos. So there's an algorithm, there's a recipe for a, uh, correlating dark matter to light. And so these kinds of simulations in fairly large boxes have now enabled us to compare with actual data. Okay? 
I think Joel will be showing you many more of these. So for those of you who are curious, I just wanted to see if I can get this to work. It doesn't really matter because Joel will be showing you spectacularly. Um, this, this was going to be a movie of a small region that would form a cluster today. So this is a, a sort of a real sort of small piece of a piece of the universe where you would form what looks like a dense cluster of galaxies today. So what I want to give you here is just a visual sense of the kinds of observational uh, anchors we have there uh, at various effects. So we have the cosmic we spent a lot of time on that. So then there's alignment of the forest, there's supernovae, that, that supernovae have been sort of critical in um, honing in on dark energy in the universe. And there's primordial nucleosynthesis, then anchors the model, the galaxy surveys where you match the distribution. Then there's 21 centimeters of data still forthcoming here, galaxy clusters, and gravitational lensing. So what, what we now have, this is an outdated plot, but I'm just giving you a feel for what this is. So this is the power spectrum, the current power spectrum of structure in the universe. Okay? And just to give you a sense that we actually have data, observational data. These are all real data with error bars. Look at the range on the x-axis in terms of the physical scale. So the wave number and physical scale are sort of inverse of each other. So that is very small scales, the line in alpha, is very large scales, the cosmic line goes back. So you know this theory is very, very well tested. Sorry. <clears throat> so here we are. Um, as I alluded to early on, this model has some parameters a few cosmological parameters. And the big question is, I mean, we have reasonably, uh, reasonably good measurements of the values of these parameters. As I said, you know, everything hangs pretty, uh, pretty nicely. But then the philosophical question is, why these particular values? And this is relevant because if these values were even slightly different, we wouldn't have this realization of the universe. Right? And of course, the, you know, if, we are, if, we are in, if the quest is for a fundamental theory, we don't quite have one because we don't know the nature of dark matter, we don't know the nature of dark energy, and we don't know what precise initial conditions existed for our, our universe and why. What, 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 what kind of distribution, if there was one, from which these initial conditions were drawn, etc., etc. So I want to talk very briefly about, because I want to pitch, you know, my particular interest are sort of these objects one of my research interests is these objects. And the reason I think these are very powerful objects, so these are clusters of galaxies, what you see as these, so these are the largest repositories of dark matter. You don't see the dark matter. What you're seeing are galaxies, these sort of yellow specks, about a thousand of them that are held together by the gravity of a huge dark matter halo. And the reason, so these are such large repositories of dark matter that in our universe, they act as gravitational lenses, they deflect light, say they deflect light from background sources, bend them, distort them, and so looking through this lens, you see these highly elongated, um, there's a pointer which I should use. So these are actually distorted shapes of perfectly decent looking background galaxies. Those have been sort of mangled and stretched out uh, and lensed. And what these objects allow you to do, because lensing the strength of the distortion depends on the amount of dark matter there is in this object, as well as the geometry of the universe, the curvature of space, and the actual sort of ratio of distances, relative distances between the source and the lens. So these objects are particularly interesting because they allow you to hand to tackle both these problems in, in one go. Because the strength of lensing is proportional uh, to the dark matter distribution in the lens, as well as through the geometry of light travel from distant objects through the lens, it's sensitive to dark energy. And so this is, um, this is just to show you that it actually depends. This is the lens. It's now putatively shown to be a single galaxy. This is a distant galaxy. So the light bending, the degree of light bending, depends on the mass, the foreground mass, and the ratio of angular diameter distances. So both you get you know, both the geometry and the dark matter distribution. And there are, so we understand it quite well at the moment. And depending on the alignment of background sources, 
You can have multiple images of the same object. So you know, all of this is theoretically extremely well understood. They're observationally detected, as I just showed you, showed you in the previous image. It's another cluster, and you can see a highly elongated, multiply imaged arc in this region. It's a highly nonlinear region. So we can calculate all of this. In fact, what we can do is we can now make these wonderful maps, dark matter maps. So this is a map that shows you how dark matter is clumped in this cluster. This corresponds to this bright region here. It's actually flipped. And this region is this guy. So we are now at, at so these are again predictions. So what we can do is this, so in creating this map, we have made no assumptions other than general relativity and light travel in the universe. And what we can now do is we can go and test. I'm, I'm just showing you how you can do finer and finer tests of this model and how this model still passes those tests. Right, so I remember doing this paper several years ago and was very excited because, you know, if you can prove that this model doesn't work, right, you'd be famous instantly. But, you know, I was hoping it didn't work. It matches to within the errors incredibly well. Okay, so why all this fuss about dark matter so, and structure formation? So some of the tests of this theory, which are, um, which are very, very important, are sort of the nature of dark matter itself. And one way we can astrophysically get at it, as opposed to the particle physics um, uh, data from the labs of what particle it may be, is that the formation of structure and, um, and how clumping structure is and how clump the clumpiness, how long it survives, depends on the nature of dark matter. So this is the same initial conditions for warm dark matter, simulation involved. It's called dark matter, and you can even visually see that this looks a lot smoother, a lot less clumpy than this. So this is what sort of thing. Okay, so the question. So let's get to what are some of the troublesome questions. So some of the troublesome questions are, okay, so can cosmological simulations really help us validate cosmological theories? So can we, can the framework that we have uh, actually um, provide us help us discriminate between cold dark matter and some other theory. So it's very problematic. Okay, it's very problematic, partly because A, a we don't have any candidates. We don't have any candidate theories that we can actually calculate and simulate at this level and actually compare and then actually stand up. Okay, at the moment we don't really have one. Okay, so why is it that, um, as I said, one of the, um, one of the, um, problematic issues is really the relationship of simulations to reality to the model. Right? What it is, what is that relationship? And the reason that's important is because we want to understand how different theories uh, can be discriminated, can they be discriminated by just you know, performing high resolution simulations. So the reason why do we need to simulate in your it's a good time to ask that, it's so obvious, it's an inability to perform any other kind of controlled experiments in the universe, supernova goes up here, that's all you have. You can't make it go up here, there, or wherever you want. And it provides a temporary realization of a very complex process, and it enable, enables comparison directly with observed reality. But then the tricky thing is the relationship between models and reality. Uh, and I, here I want to pitch that um, um, Eric, um, there's some very interesting um, ideas that I'll come to the end of that. So, and of course, one, they want to think about how these simulations are different from actually from experiments. So experiments are at this time. a little bit more about the, what, what exactly is the issue about, in the last um, thing, the relationship between models and reality? I mean, what's the exact issue there? How good the models are as approximations? No, and how good, how good the models are is one question. The um, other question is really when we simulate are we really simulating a fair sample of the universe, given that we just have one universe of, of which we are simulating a piece? Uh, that is problematic, right? philosophically, wouldn't you say? Well, that, yeah, that is, but that's also an issue, not of, I guess, not of the law itself, but of the, an aspect of the, yeah, yeah. So it's some approximations, that a good approximation. Sure. It's, it's something big, but not, maybe not big enough. Right. And um, uh, whether it's big and not big enough to capture the range of phenomenology that's allowed in this theoretical model. Uh, yeah. I, why, why, why aren't there attempts to, sim to simulate the whole thing? Joe? <laughs> what? It's well, computationally very, yeah, very so expensive. Basically, given the amount of computer time that one can get these days, you have a choice of simulating only a billion light years across, 
only. Right. At extremely high resolution, right. which is what my hand does. Or simulating basically the entire observable universe, but it's so extremely low it. resolution, so sure. all you can see are clusters. But presumably you want to see both kinds of things. Yes. Yeah, but, but in fact, as I'll explain, okay. what we've done really breaches those gaps. So there's, as far as I can see, no important issue. Suppose you could simulate the entire observable universe. Yeah. Since the entire observable universe isn't the whole universe, why isn't that still just an approximation? <coughs> well, this is an issue that's known in the trade as cosmic variance. Cosmic variance. Cosmic variance. I'll discuss cosmic yeah. variance. Variance. Oh. And so that's you mean Sean Farrell's blog? <laughs> no. <laughs> Sean Farrell didn't invent that. That's a bit more <laughs> profound than his blog, which is actually quite good and makes for good reading. But no, I think that's an important issue right. that um, will come to cosmic variance. I was just going to say that, you know, so technically the issue here is cosmic variance and how we make sense of a measurement and what's an error bar on the measurement when we make a measurement because you know, we're really comparing observations or measurements to the simulation. And when, uh, yeah, I I'm going to leave it to Joe. It's sticky. And, uh, but believe me, it is a real issue. So. Okay, so um, the reason cosmological uh, simulations are somewhat different from actual experiments is that you know, experiments are sort of epistemically privileged because of their sort of materiality, right? And they have a more concrete relationship with reality. They're sort of the unique, uniqueness, and easy, it's easier to establish and quantify. You know, I'm sort of really skirting around this of what is cosmic variance, really, the problem with cosmic variance. And um, so one can then talk about what is particular to cosmological simulations as opposed to all simulations, right? So Eric Winsberg has written a wonderful book in which he talks about simulations sort of globally, climate change, cosmology, genetics, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But so what is specific, what sets cosmological simulations apart is what interests me. And I think that the special, you know, the universe itself cannot be subjected to experimentation. You can't observationally compare it to other universes. And the concept of any laws of physics that apply to only one object, I think, are questionable. The concept of probability is problematic in the context of the existence of one object. And the interpretation of comparison, so again, sort of this is sort of cosmic variance as, as well as how we are using, what kind of tool are simulations in, uh, in the scheme of things. So we've here in cosmology, we've used simulations for proof, for validation of theories. We also use it as a way to derive explanations, sort of either full or partial. And when I say partial, I may refer to the fact that there's some unknowns, like galaxy formation isn't fully well understood, etc. And we do make predictions, and they are sort of the substitute for controlled experiments. So obviously there's a theory, there are observations, and simulations sort of sit somewhere in between um, observations and theories. And I think what I find um, is one of the challenges is that we need to expand our notion. Simulations make us, push us to expand the notion of a how a theory or an explanation can really be tested, verified, um, and, and accepted. So I just have here, just you know, sort of a laundry list of, of the next few slides, I just have a laundry list of what I think sort of the problems uh, are. So there are limits on testing theories, um, and so this is really the key issue. Um, and the issue of cosmic variance. And you know, I, I sort of, I brought the term up, and I, I was pretty sure Joel was going to mention, uh, mention that. And, and the question is, you know, have simulations have actually radically transformed cosmology? Right? So, but um, let me just move to the final, since I'm reaching my time. Well, I, I know you have, you have half an hour left. Do I? Yeah. Six six fifteen. Are you serious? Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I do not have like okay. I you want less time? Well, I have to open more questions. Yeah, another question. Yeah. I'm um, just going to you raised before about it being only one object and being strange for more than either one object. How are things more different from other worlds and also that? No, so that's okay. It's not just the fact that you have the one object. The fact that you have these a handful of parameters that are sufficient to describe the entire universe and then they have specific values. So it's having one object with those measurements, with the values of those parameters measured to be what they are. That's the problem. 
So the way to get around that has been. But why is that a problem? Say more why that's a problem. Well, the, the reason that's a problem is if you know it's um, if any of these constants had values that were even slightly different, life would not have been possible. We wouldn't be here, etc. So it's all very finely tuned. It's a fine tuning problem. Mm -hmm. So this fine tuning problem, one of the solutions has been the multiverse. This idea that you have some initial probability distribution for all these constant six, as they turn out to be, and that there are multiple universes, multiple realizations of, of universes, each of which has a particular draw of six, and we happen to be in one with the draw of six that we measure, right? And that there are other universes out there. So, so that's sort of the, that was the initial motivation for the multiverse proposal that we are in and explain the, uh, simultaneously have room uh, for other possible universes to exist because we'll never have empirical access. So are are they, you yourself happy with such explanation? I, I believe in it and I choose the word belief very carefully. Um, I believe in it uh, and I like it, it appeals, um, but but it does bother me enormously that we can't really have empirical access. So the ways in which I prefer to evaluate explanations, sort of scientific empirical, you know, you can't have that basis. And I think I was having um, a discussion at lunch with people on my table, but I think that is a problem that I have with the multiverse theories and string theory in general. So the fact, the reason, so the fuss about the new kind of explanation is that what we now have is we have classes of theories that describe laws, the physics, what have you, whatever you want to call them, pre-Big Bang. And the only stipulation, so they're, they're mathematically elegant, what, what have you. I mean, they're, you know, the criteria for evaluating an explanation is mathematical compactness, elegance, beauty, um, usefulness, etc. are criteria. You know, there, there's a whole bunch of theories. And the only way and the only requirement of these theories is that they need extrapolations of them to our universe have to produce the laws that we see. And, and I find that very problematic because I feel that it is impossible really to distinguish between various options that you have at the stage when you don't have any empirical access. And the the issue is really not so much that if any of those models has, makes predictions in our universe that are observable that will help you discriminate uh, between them, I'm not convinced that there are such clear-cut predictions that can actually be made at the moment. I mean, there is a claim that if you have these bubble universes and they collide, there will be some shadow that's seen in the cosmic microwave background. Yeah, maybe it's a question that we don't have the kind of precision to actually detect something like that at the moment. I'm, I'm uh, willing to be open, but, but I think it's very, very problematic that I don't know which of those theories is a good description of the pre-Big Bang universe. You don't think but it is? Let me just mention that, yeah. that that claim is due to Anthony Aguirre and Matt Who's Johnson. Who's going to be, yeah. And both Anthony which Aguirre and which Matt claim, Johnson. Which claim, that uh, it's possible to detect, uh -huh. contrary to what's said here. Yeah. In principle, it is possible to tell whether the multiverse is right. And the way it would be done was described first by Anthony Aguirre and his former graduate student, Matt Johnson, who are both going to be lecturing on this next okay. week. So you'll have, you, you know, you'll have the, the view, the, the in theory you could do it view from them. Well, yeah. actually, uh, Matt is heavily involved in analyzing the, the data. data to see if there is a we don't yet know whether they're something they're singing or not. And you'll also hear the so-called landscape story from the person who, as much as anyone, invented yeah. Lenny Susskind. So he's going to give three lectures next week, one of which will be about that. So you know, you're going to, I mean, as I said, because you know, I'm just giving you a teaser, guys. I mean, just kind of laying out without a lot of the jargon, just sort of a broad brush picture. So then you have like three, four lectures from people who are, are working very actively in these fields. Yeah. So just a uh, uh, clarification. So, uh, worries about fine tuning aside, uh, would it be right to say that given a theory or group of theories like eternal inflation, yeah. um, you know, certain regions are never going to stop inflating, 
maybe fluctuations early on or later on, or maybe quantum tunneling later on will lead to a multiverse. It's, and in other words, can you connect a multiverse theory to some sort of eternal inflation? Sure. I mean, there, there are many, many models out there uh, that connect kinds of classes of, so I, I remember I already told you sort of, you probably uh, detected a sort of lightly lay skepticism. I mean, you know, again, with inflationary models, there are some subclasses that can be distinguished, but generically, um, you can't, you know, you can't, you know, you, you can narrow down the parameter space, but you can't really um, finally pick one model that works for sure. The is only it, model that works. It, sorry, just a, yeah. just for my own So some people speak as if, you know, to put it crudely, a multiverse, a multiverse is sort of like a prediction of quantum mechanics plus eternal inflation. And, and I'm wondering if that, is there that kind of inevitability or is this well, I, I don't actually know um, enough about the details of the particular model that you're talking well, about. So Max Deckhart, uh, famous article, described four different kinds of multiverse. Three and one of those that kinds that of multiverse is, as you said, uh, it is intimately connected with quantum mechanics plus inflation. Inflation is inherently quantum mechanics. Again, this will be discussed in an amazing in detail. detail next week. Yeah. Yeah, so there are these multi multiverse level one, level two, level three. I mean, these will all be kind of fresh. I believe down. even for level two, though, you need quantum mechanics, mechanics. as an input. And level three is a much more central yes. quantum mechanics. Yeah, yeah. And I think a, a point to really stress is that uh, you might think you want, you'd have no empirical access whatsoever to the multiverse. But uh, you should all keep it open in mind to the idea that, of course, if there was empirical access, we would want to find it so it's worthwhile to investigate the theories such that there may be, let's say, signals in the gravity wave background or signals in the CMB. Um, and that uh, the real issue for you is not that, but that it's uh, situations where there are two models which make exactly the same predictions. They don't have any different kind of empirical access. So then what, what, do, we, what do we do in order to distinguish between those, those yeah, theories? Okay. Which one gives a better explanation? Yeah. It's very hard to quantify which one gives a better explanation in a way that everyone will agree with. Absolutely. You nailed it. Yeah. But is there no hope that, um, do you have any hope that um, some particular theory will be so much more compelling for aesthetic reasons or whatever, not for a But that, that's precisely sharing my problem. The thing is, it's not sufficient for me for the explanation to be just aesthetically compelling, right? Uh, this, this is what I'm grappling with. Uh, what is aesthetically compelling? What defines, is it a simpler... You'll know it when you see it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. Yes. The slide before that, that you went over, we didn't have enough time. Could we look at that one? Yeah. So, um, I think how... So I, I think um, Andrew actually said it uh, much better than, um, probably more clearly than, um, I managed to. So the problem really is when you have two theories that make very similar predictions for the late universe, for example, and yet are fundamentally quite different in what they say about the pre-Big Bang universe, to which we have no empirical access, then how do you discriminate between those theories? The reason this is a real problem is that you have to understand by construction, people who are making these mathematical theories have to ensure that they patch on and agree to what is seen today. Otherwise, you know, if the late universe looks completely different, that's not a credible theory because we have observational access. So I think the problematic thing is distinguishing theories that uh, are different, that are radically different in terms of the physics. Say, for example, one of them uh, requires or um, patches on nicely to quantum mechanics to um, and uh, one this is sort of pre big bang again so we don't have you won't don't have any data in, at that epoch to discriminate and at that it's unclear to me that if you have two such theories that make the same predictions which are not distinguishable at late times how you distinguish between them and what criteria you use for picking one over the other as a credible explanation. What kind of aesthetics, what kind of simplicity argument 
could you use? What kind of? It's unclear to me whether I would rank well, that I should rank theory one over theory two because it's aesthetically more pleasing. By what you know, so I find that very problematic. We have a similar problem with regard not to cosmology, but with regard, with regard to different versions of quantum mechanics yeah. itself. Yes, and as you know, that's an unresolved. Uh, <laughs> Um, it's unresolved. How to sure. really deal with it? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I have one really quick question. One five more substantial question. Uh, yeah. So, really, really quick question is just uh, on the how inflation explains the homogeneity of the uh, like the background. Um, so, you mentioned something like it explains how they could distinct regions of the sky could in fact have been because of contact prior to inflation. I've also heard like explanations that should say, well, even if there's some initial things, the equation kind of smooths them all out. I basically just wondering, I mean, presumably both of those are like very metaphorical. Are they kind of, I don't know, are, are those two ways of saying the same kind of thing or are these two different things? Those two ways of saying the same sort of thing. Right. Because there are sort of two problems that I didn't actually mention that problem here. So one other problem is the fact that omega total, which <coughs> omega is a measure of the total energy density of the universe. As I said, it's the sum of the various components, contributions of the various components. And that appears to be one. And the reason, uh, that, and that's problematic in the sense that omega is sort of, um, unless you started out very, very close to one, by late times you would be quite far from one, and you measure it to be one today. So requiring, if it is one today, it was very close, it was exactly one going back in time. It couldn't have been higher or lower, right? So it's really, um, and that, that's called the flatness problem. So inflation was invoked to solve both the horizon problem and the flatness problem, and they are slightly different. Um, but inflation actually solves both of those problems. So I take it it would be kind of awkward to make it a law that omega is one, exactly one. I have to be very careful because I, I know what you mean. You're tricking me into law, right? I know what laws are. <laughs> and I know what Nancy Cartwright says about laws and I know what everyone else says. Yeah, I think we don't want to make it a law. <laughs> well, well, omega could still be different from one in our universe at some very, very distant decimal place. And then if you... If That's right. If you measure that, then you would have a lower bound on the radius of curvature of oh, some larger closed universe we could be embedded in. Right. But I, I you know, that, that's a very, very large decimal place. Yeah, it could be like 50 decimal places, yeah. which is not, not observation. If it were a law, that's exactly one. Which is probably, I, I know not enough about this to know whether that's sensible or not, but I believe it probably is. Right. Yeah. This potential testing of the um, multiverse theory of collisions of bubbles. Is it thought that it could potentially test the whether the, the six constants vary from one bubble to the next? Sure, yeah. There are various versions of the multiverse theory. And yes, there, there are. So I think, um, hold your horses for Anthony. Uh, we should be able to tell you the models. So actually, I, um, I guess I am finishing a little bit ahead of time. I um, actually thought I had an hour, so for some reason. Yeah, but if there are more questions, I'm happy yeah. to answer. I don't know if this is one of those questions that will, you know, I'm sure we'll be talked about later yeah. on, but I don't know if you want to refer to it. Um, so, inflation uh, is going to explain homogeneity. We observe faster than light years. Okay, cool. Um, would you, do you think that inflation also, various theories of the type of inflation, explain the initial homogeneity of the universe? The initial you mean the fluctuation spectra? Yeah, so um, I think. You mean the initial low-entropy state? The initial low entropy state, I yes, see. Not the oh, not the actual. Well, that's the claim, right? But that is definitely what is claimed. Okay. Okay, yeah. cool. Okay. Um, so you're talking about a lot about the sort of potential problems or difficulties that are posed by the fact that it's just one universe. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering whether, I don't know, I think that there's help to be solved from other kinds of sciences where there's only one object to study. So like, climate science, or paleontology, or geology, or, I don't know, it seems like there are various sciences that only have one single object, and in, in, in some cases, we similarly can't kind of run experiments on it in any kind of sense that we would typically recognize. Um, I mean, yeah, this is quite speculative, but like, are there useful things that cosmology could learn from them, or that they could learn from cosmology, or? 
Well, I think that the, um, that's a really good question. Um, the, only, um, the only other theory that I have thought about um, in terms of an analog that might be interesting is um, sort of geology and plate tectonics. So you're in a very similar situation. So we have a very good theory of plate tectonics. We really understand the motions of plates, but we can never predict what an earthquake is going to happen and where it's going to happen. Despite the fact that we can quite exquisitely predict how the various plates move, how much friction there is, and we really have a very robust theory. And we really cannot, but we still cannot predict where you will have volcanic eruptions. I mean, you know where the fault lines are generically, but you'll never be able to precisely say, tomorrow this part, you know, this, this is an earthquake. So and I think that is probably captures some of um, so the generic problem of these kinds of, yeah. Actually, I think you're trying to make the distinction between weather and climate. We can expect that our ability to predict climate will improve. Climate is like the motion of the place. Sure. But weather is like the earthquake. And right. the ability to predict that is very limited because it's highly nonlinear. Right. I, I wanted to come, come back to this, this question about uh, entropy because a lot of people misunderstand the nature of inflation. So according to standard inflationary theory, Essentially, all the entropy in the history of the universe was essentially all of us. Or essentially, right. all of the entropy that has been generated in the entire history of the universe was generated in the process known in the trade as reheating, reheating. which occurs when inflation ends and the universe starts expanding as you know the ordinary Hubble expanding universe. No longer exponential. Right, so, unless you follow on some people. Uh, associated a huge amount of entropy with the production of black holes. At that time. No, no, much later. The, the, the production of black holes in the, in the recent universe. Turns out that's another form of entropy. But it's a special kind of entropy because it's very limited in space. The, the entropy that fills the universe was generated at the end of inflation. Inflation is not something that decreases entropy. It is the main generator of entropy by a huge factor. The total amount of entropy that's been generated by everything that's happened since then, gravity, stars, everything, is infinitesimal compared to the entropy mm -hmm. that was generated at the end of inflation. Mm -hmm. so no, I thought nothing. Saying, I thought nothing decreases entropy. No, no, I'm not saying anything decreases. Yeah, but you're, you're right. No, no, you no, inflation saying, increases it, but I mean, the, the thought. If you look that, at the increase, there's this huge increase. Yeah in this tiny fraction of a second. So would you say, is it the case then that, that all that, that increases, is, is any further increase is negligible compared to that? Exactly. Uh, all the losses all the entropy exactly. increase since then, with mm -hmm. the sole exception of the production of black holes, has been completely negligible. Mm -hmm. I mean, not from, our, not from our point of view, but, yeah, yeah. but if, you, if you just do the arithmetic, mm -hmm. you'll hear more about that, I'm sure, from uh, the various lectures next week. But what I'm telling you is absolutely standard stuff. Mm -hmm. So the low entropy state is literally on the heels of the inflationary process or inflationary stages of evolution. The low entropy state comes into existence on the heels of now, this whole low entropy state stuff doesn't make, makes no sense to me at all. I've never understood that whole way of thinking about cosmology. That's well, not the modern that picture. Is. That was a picture that dated back to the end of the 19th century. I'm, I'm sorry. That's what, I'm not I'm understanding what it is you're saying makes no sense. So what are you saying? Yeah. What are you practically all the entropy was generated in the beginning of the Big Bang. It's I, not a low entropy state. No, it's I understand that. But of course that what you're saying is it before inflation, before this. No, 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 no. At the end of inflation. Yes, I understand that. That means if it increased by a lot and then it started, it was even lower. Was very lower. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. So <laughs> then the low entropy <laughs> is the end of inflation. But in order to get from inflation to the expanding universe, you have to produce a huge amount of entropy. Good. Right. So it, it, wait, wait, I'm, I'm confused. I'm confused. Sorry, 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 sorry. I really have to. I'm sorry. I have to insist. So what I was interested in was an explanation of the initial entropy state, right? And it sounds prior like you're saying... Prior to inflation. Prior to inflation. Right, prior right. to inflation. It sounds like you're saying... I mean, I, I, the, the question I put out there was, does inflation provide an explanation of that? And, and, the, and the response I got was yes, but now you that that you're saying no, no, not not initial low entropy, uh, not the very lowest entropy state. Well, the start, 
Is that so inf no, inflation no, no. tells you where you start from and then where you get to but, at the fraction. Yeah. But my, I mean, I, I, I think maybe Shelley was trying to drive at something like this. The, the relative to the kinds of considerations one is interested in when one is interested in explaining the truth of the second law of thermodynamics for ordinary physical systems, blah, 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 the comparatively negligible increase in entropy since the end of inflation is what matters for those kinds of considerations. Sure. The fact yeah. that there was a much larger increase in entropy immediately before then it is completely at right angles to, to what one is talking about when one is interested in giving an account of the truth of the second law of thermodynamics for ordinary physical systems, giving an account if people think that's relevant of the of the epistemic and causal asymmetries, so on and so forth, it may well have been that there was a fantastically larger increase of entropy immediately before that, something that dwarfs anything that occurs since. Right. So what? Okay. It's, that that it, sounds it, very compatible with the second law. That's right. It's the it's the it's the entropy increase since then that's that, that's the one one is interested in talking about and and this you know w the, the way in which one refers to the low entropy you know the uh, initial condition that something like the past <coughs> hypothesis could perfectly well be be applied to this um, to this immediate aftermath of the enormous entropy increase Please. as a result of inflation but is that still a very unlikely statement because it sounds like if the state after inflation has a certain amount of entropy, which isn't a very low amount. It's, it's, it's low, it, that is, the amount by which it's lower than ours, okay, is, is the amount by which um, entropy is increased according to, or, you know, garden variety from the state of the process. Yeah. Okay. Whether, whether that's big or small compared to the amount that it increased during inflation seems completely beside the point. Besides the point, yeah. right? I well, mean, for the discussions yeah. of the late Actually, China. just to make it all concrete, you know where the entropy is? The 99.999% the, the of the entropy? It's in the photons and the neutrinos. In those yeah. neutrinos, mm -hmm. yeah. That's... Yes, and the part of the fact. photons that were emitted by stars is a tiny the front. Do you ever wish you were a photon? <laughs> yes. <laughs> when, we're, when we're talking about low entropy states, um, an important thing is also, you need to talk about whether what it is relative to, and usually you talk about relative to the equilibrium state. So then you have to talk about what is the maximum entropy state of the observable universe, or a, the universe at any given time. And in fact, because of the expansion history, the maximum entropy grows, and it, it grows faster than the actual entropy. And that, that's a point which is, has not been really stressed. It's something which is going to be true during the inflationary process as well, given certain assumptions, but it's also true in the late time universe as well. And that this is one of the interesting features, is that you know, there were these worries about heat death, which there's a, there's a different kind of heat death in an accelerating universe. It's more of a, a cold death. Cold death. Yeah, but, but, but uh, the, 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 the distance from equilibrium is what allows interesting processes to happen and structures to form. And we're very lucky to be in a universe where there's a big difference between the maximum entry and the actual. Mm -hmm. Does that distance from equilibrium do not grow when the entropy of the students make shoot upwards? I, I, I would argue yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for your